Um, so Lynn and Melinda, I'm really excited to get to talk to you today. Um, Pre-pandemic research conducted by EEOC has shown that 70% of people said that they would not report workplace harassment um, to a manager or a supervisor. So I'm wondering if you can speak to how the events of the past year have changed the dynamics um, or may have exacerbated this problem. I'll jump in. You know, I uh, thank you, Anna. I think in a in a normal whatever that means anymore in a normal uh, day, week, month, year people are just dealing with a lot, right? You know, you just never know what's happening behind the scenes. Drugs, mental health, um, illness, uh, teenagers, <laughs> you name it. And then you look at what we've all been through in the last year with the pandemic, with the, the murder of uh, George Floyd and the, the tragedies that preceded and followed. And I think there's a natural inclination for people to weigh what they're experiencing against what they perceive others are experiencing and i think that i think that 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 comparison can sometimes lead to um those who may be experiencing something to say gosh you know how could i possibly you know um raise my hand to get attention for what i'm dealing with compared to what others are dealing with and i think that uh i think that's really unfortunate, but I, I think that that has to be occurring um, just just given the, the broader context of the environment. Thank you, um, Ali and Anna and Melinda. I'll, I'll chime in as well. Really appreciate the invitation today and it's just great to be here. I'll, I will start things off right by saying nothing particularly profound, which is that this really challenging year has upended, you know, the the normal support systems that we all have. So I think it's fair to say that even the most introverted person is probably feeling a little bit lonely and isolated by now, right? And uh, for those of us who like to see lots of people and who are used to seeing lots of people in big teams and collaborating that way, that it can be challenging. And so if you're somebody who likes to walk into someone else's office, right, or you're used to that kind of a workplace, it's difficult to always be on the screen all day. Um, and some people are new some people again may not feel as comfortable um, if they can't say something in person and so forth so um, I think it's also changed you know it's changed maybe people's awareness of reporting it's also maybe changed a little bit or can impact the culture of reporting um, you know people are worried maybe that the that uh, if they email the hotline that the company will keep a copy of it or if they're worried that you know if, if unless it's really clear and you remind people that no no we use third parties right the intake is done by a third party so that it can stay anonymous all those kinds of things sometimes can be lost right if they don't hear it and don't aren't in the workplace in an office type environment um i would say too it's harder when we're remote, I think it's harder to build and maintain trust. That was actually in the description, um, in Ali, in, the, in your description of the session for today. Working on maintaining a positive culture and maintaining a culture of trust, I think is something that can be really challenging and is essential, of course, to report harassment and misconduct. Absolutely essential to feel like you can trust those that you're reporting it to and that you know retaliation and other forms of misconduct won't uh, multiply and won't rebound on you for reporting. So um, just briefly, I would throw out, you know, the, the some um, solutions and some ways to mitigate those downsides are continuing at your company to talk about culture. What is your culture? What does it mean? Um, you know, a little bit like what Rob was saying earlier, you have to keep reminding people what are what is the company about? Um, it, you know, what what are the values? Have have town halls and meetings and sessions and even guest speakers, right? That talk about the company values and, and talk about trust, transparency, reporting, those kinds of things, integrity, you know, pick your pick your moment, which one you want to emphasize. Um, but so, and then I think also maybe even, um, even if you're not a chief compliance officer, right? I think about this stuff all, all the time. I'm sure Melinda does too. How do you have it in smaller conversations? So not just a town hall, not just a big company, not, you know, company-wide event, which are great, but how do you even continue to have it kind of in, in smaller conversations, one-on-ones, brown bags, um, you know, training nudges, monthly videos, et cetera. So um, those are, you know, we all have really different ways of working and being and, and 
and keeping up conversations and trying to keep discussing these issues and, and maintaining and, and talking about trust in all these different avenues that, that allow people with different ways of working to, to plug in, I think that's a, that's a start. Yeah, and I think to Lynn, working off of your point of the importance of communicating values, I think, you know, even before the pandemic, something I noticed um, and have heard from others about is a hesitance or unwillingness to report harassment in particularly mission-driven organizations where the emphasis to all employees is on the larger collective goal or collective mission rather than the individual. Um, and I think it can therefore seem almost inconceivable to be the one to rock the boat and distract from that mission in any way. So almost a different sort of insignificant to, to what Belinda had said. And then if I just actually do a yeah, follow-up on that, I, I, I'll apologize. I'm going a little bit off script, everybody, but but the the... Uh, my response to that, which I can totally understand how that could happen, but my response to that is if the company could find a way to talk about the fact that speaking up is showing that you care for the mission, because the, the mission will be corrupted if you don't. So not to put that onus back on the individual, but for example, at Zoom, our values are care and caring for the community, caring for our teammates, caring for our customers. So if you don't speak up, you know, we talk in a, in a more positive sense, we talk about please show you care by speaking up because and i and i can just feel i can imagine that tension at a at a mission driven organization um but but the the mission will be will be corrupted if 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 you don't try and talk about how you know that that um to make to make that a uh make that reporting make that speaking up something that's that's encouraged yeah i think i think that's such a great point um and then another question Another reason that I think employees can be hesitant um, to report misconduct is that they're worried about what will happen to the person they're reporting about, both in pandemic times and pre-pandemic and post-pandemic times. Um, and, you know, I think they people don't want to add to the person's stress, um, particularly when there's, you know, a zero tolerance policy that they believe to be the only policy a company has. Um, so how can we address that? So I, I think even uh, even in companies that don't tout uh, having a zero tolerance policy, I think a lot of employees assume that there is this zero tolerance uh, mindset out there and that that's a really good thing also, that it shows that that's a company that is supportive and not going to tolerate um, you know, uh, inappropriate behavior. And I think what a lot of research has found and what I've also seen in my own experience is that it's actually, uh, that's it's actually not true, that having a zero tolerance policy or mindset causes employees to feel like, shoot, I don't, you know, I don't want someone to be fired, um, you know, or this person could be really critical to my program. Um, and and this is, you know, critical for this, the, the revenue of the company. And I can't be the one that takes down the ship. Um, and so I think it's it's super important for employees at all levels to understand that there's a range of options out there for for addressing behavior that's not appropriate, you know, from a simple counseling session um, to to obviously termination, right? Um, we've we've handled it ourselves, you know. Um, maybe it's it, maybe it's training, maybe it's coaching, maybe it's a letter in someone's file. I mean, there's just a broad range. And I think the more a company can take a very um, individual approach, looking at the situation, thinking critically and ensuring their employees that they're going to look really thoughtfully at what's happened and come up with the right solution, I think is really important. That's going to encourage employees to feel comfortable coming forward. And, you know, I'll also say that, um, you know, over the years, I've, I've, um, try to encourage employees to come forward um, on their own terms with with the um, the guidance that you know when if you can if you can intervene before something becomes a really massive issue sometimes that's the most compassionate way to approach uh, a situation like this so you know when you have a, a situation where someone's like well I'm really I really liked John and John's a great guy but he's doing this and it really upsets me it bothers me I'm uncomfortable uh, I don't want anything bad to happen to him well maybe maybe John you know maybe we don't say anything to John and this escalates and it continues and then we get to a point where we're not going to sit down and have a coaching session with John we're going to do something far more severe um, and that maybe it is going to be termination and 
you know, in retrospect, you might wish that you had said something sooner to help them. So um, I think just making sure that you communicate that there's a range, we're going to be thoughtful, we're going to um, do what makes sense, but we're also not going to tolerate it. But zero tolerance doesn't mean we do nothing or, or that we, you know, it always means termination. Yeah, a couple of points I think I would add to that. Um, first of all, on, along the lines of uh, encouraging people to speak up and knowing that not every type of situation requires termination. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, there was actually a situation um, in my own company not too, too long ago, a new male executive joined and other people were noticing that um, this person was interrupting all the time. But this is not a case of harassment, but you know, a male executive, someone coming in and interrupting mostly women constantly. <laughs> and and somebody said to me, you should say something. And I said, I really don't want to say anything. You know, it'll it'll the kinks will work out, the person's new, etc. And the person said to me, this other, you know, ally said, really we should say something because if the person means well, they're gonna take that well. And again, I don't mean to equate that with a form of harassment or, or a more serious form of harassment, but when they had the conversation, the person could not have been nicer and was honestly really mortified that, that he'd been doing it. And it, of course, that's not every case either that the person takes it that well. But but in that case, it was somebody who did, did, did what, for whatever reason, things were, fire, were misfiring, right, for a while. And we got back on track and is really now a champion of listening to people, but yet we, you know, depending on the personality, as I mentioned before, we're all different. Some people don't listen as well on Zoom as they do in person. You know, maybe some people do better with Zoom than they do in person. So people have to make those adjustments. Um, in terms of what I would say, just briefly, in terms of of not making every case um, that that gets talked about one that requires termination, at um, in my last role, we actually um, eventually, what we were proud of this actually, we, we, we did a website that had real life speak up cases, anonymized of course, and we would pull them from years past, right? And we would ch change the location so that people couldn't, you know, identify anyone. But, but from my research, I, we, we learned that it was important not to only put the most serious things because that would have potentially a chilling effect. So we, we demonstrated cases where people had come forward and they'd gotten discipline or coaching or had a commissions claw back or had, of course, had some terminations. But we did include, as Melinda's describing, you know, we, we intentionally included a mix so that people would see that that also that that the, you know, the, the complaints team is not all or nothing. You know, the, we're, we're people too. We're reasonable. We want to talk it through. We want to keep employees if we can. We want to rehabilitate people, you know, per my example, if we can. And, and so if you can, and even Rob today talked about having an internal transparency report. Well, that would be another way potentially, right? If you don't want to put it up on a website where it could go external, you could have an internal report or an internal session where you talk about the variety of, of responses you've had to reports of misconduct. And that way, hopefully um, people can see that not everything is, is kind of, you know, pushing somebody out of the org. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that, Lynn. Now I'm going off script, but I'm so glad you said that about um, you know somebody being so appreciative, because I I found the same to be true that probably in at least half the cases somebody's doing something and they don't realize it, and they're truly appreciative. God, I, I had no idea, you know. And and we have a, a big intern and new grad program, and sometimes you have they're coming into the workforce for the first time, and they really do appreciate that feedback. So. Thank you for adding that.